So this is Stateless Society is Impossible Part 2. Again, I don't think it's impossible. I actually think it's quite possible. Um, in, in this Part 2, I'm dealing with the argument that uh, a stateless society will necessarily succumb to external aggression. It cannot defend itself, and the state is therefore better. At least you're not going to be killed or conquered or, or something. Um, because that's really the argument. The, the, the argument that we're making is not that the anarchy is perfect. There is no meaningful definition of perfect that I know of, so it's sort of silly to, 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 to be speaking about um, uh, you know, an organization, a way to organize society, uh, such as an anarchy, for example, in terms of perfect, not perfect. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that anarchy is not necessarily worse than the state. It's not worse, it's not impossible, and it's not necessarily unstable, inherently, uh, internally, as I try to you know present an argument for in my previous video but uh, it's also not necessarily worse than a state in terms of defense um, the, or, or, the organizing and defense of a stateless society is not impossible that's sort of my one line of argument the other line of argument is this the state is not perfect either the state for defense uh, is actually a highly problematic system uh, lengthy and Arthur uh, has made a ton of videos on, on this issue, and again, I, I highly recommend that you subscribe to him and check out his stuff. Um, he has a recent video uh, on his channel that I think is entitled uh, Anarchy vs. State. Mm. Anarchy vs. State, the final showdown, or something like that. Check it out, it's great. Um, so I'm going to be borrowing from that and other videos by him and other people um, in dealing with this issue. So I, I actually I typed up a very long response in a Facebook chat, not chat, but a common thread. So I'm, I'm just going to read what I have here. Hopefully it's going to work as a video. Um, okay, so here we go. So um, there's several things to consider uh, when thinking about external, the external threat argument. First of all, let's compare apples to apples. Nobody's saying the stateless defense guarantees perfect protection, but neither does the state. Just because it says that it will protect you doesn't mean that it can or that it, that it would even if it could. States guarantee many things like comfortable retirement and the old age, you know, pensions that you can buy something, actually actually buy a good decent living with, free health care, you know, and, a, and a wide variety of rivers of milk and honey, but it does not follow that just because the state promised something, that it's going to come to pass. So, in order to show the statelessness is not unequivocally worse than the state for purposes of defense, I think I only need to demonstrate that A, the state provision of defense is actually not perfect and quite problematic, and B, the stateless defense is actually possible. So, here we go. Uh, number one, states do not actually guarantee you personally and your family the service of protection from invasion. And that's a very important point that bears repeating, although a lot of smart people have made it before. States can lose wars, obviously. Roughly half of them have. You know, every war has a winner and a loser. Uh, you know, uh, just because a state you know, amasses huge amounts of resources and, in, and, and, and devotes them to defense, say the Maginot Line in France, you know, uh, doesn't mean that's going to be successful. The state is not a guarantee of safety. Just because you're under a state doesn't mean you're guaranteed to be safe from invaders. You may sleep better at night knowing that somewhere out there there's an army, but you know, you know, you know where I'm where I'm going with this. And, and and the next point, point number two, is the priority of the state's armed forces is not to protect you personally. I repeat, it's not to protect you, the population of the country. Uh, their number one priority is to protect the government. They serve the government. They do not serve you personally. They do not serve the people in general. There's no such thing as the people in general. Um, their number one priority is to serve the government and protect the government. Just because a, a regiment of the Chinese army is attacking your, I don't know, your, your little town in New Jersey, or, you know, uh, the government is not sending a detachment of Navy SEALs to protect you and your family. That's not happening. You're on your own. They are busy protecting, you know, the president or the Congress or whatever. There's no specific guarantee of protection for you. And that's important to understand. That's that's what people fail to grasp, I think, a lot of the time. Point number three. Speaking of wars, states are actually infinitely more likely to start wars. 
So if you think that, you know, just because you have a state, you live under a state, which has an army and a navy and whatnot, that you are safer in case someone launches a war against you, what about the wars that your own state may launch? If you're going to like the state, you have to like it in totality, warts and all, so, you know, you have to accept the possibility that your state will start wars and put you in danger that way. In fact, the United States have, and most other states have, started wars. Not every single one, but a lot of them. Point number four, external threats are a wonderful excuse to crack down on the people of your own country. Actually, it's the best excuse there is. Think Patriot Act, think NDAA, NDAA uh, etc. Any war, or even a threat of war, an armed conflict of some some nature, war and terror, whatever, or you know, the threat of terrorist acts, always, always leads to greater power amassed by the government over the individual. Oh, we're, we're doing this to protect you, you schmuck. Uh, nobody complains. Oh, we, we need to submit because, you know, if we do, they can protect us against those horrible, insert your monster du jour here. Terrorists, you know, the Chechen terrorists, the uh, Muslim terrorists, um, the French, the Germans, whatever. People scare easily, and once they're scared, they will be more uh, likely to agree to abuse. This has been done countless times, countless times. And after the war or the emergency is over, they never quite give all of their emergency powers back. Of course not. Think things like tax withholding, rent control, and, and less harmless things, although these things are very, very harmful. They're still with us 67 years later. They were sold to the public as wartime emergencies during World War II. We still have them all. Call me cynical, but I suspect that this is by design. And again, at this point, I would refer to Robert Higgs and his ratchet effect and, and multiple books that he's written on the subject. Um, Crisis and Leviathan is the best. And if you haven't read it yet, and you, if you're thinking about these things and you, you know, you're looking to form an opinion, an informed opinion on these things, you owe it to yourself to get that book and read it cover to cover. I don't, I don't know of any better work that covers this uh, you know, crisis and emergency as an excuse to amass more power for the government issue. So you still feeling safe? Still buying the We Exist Only to Serve and Protect You song and dance? Well, if you do, let's move on to number five. Uh, point number five, standing armies can be, and most of them have been, used by governments against their own people. And case in point is, is the United States. For example, you know, I'm not going to go into, like, uh, you know, Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Encavade or you know, any other, you know, sort of more obvious monsters. Like the Chinese or the Khmer Rouge. The thing about the U.S., right after the formation of the U.S., under the present Constitution, what was the, the one of the first, if not the first, deployment of the armed forces? Was it against an external threat? No. No. It was against the farmers in western Pennsylvania who refused to pay the ridiculous and outrageous whiskey taxes. So the whiskey rebellion was a tax rebellion. Um, and Alexander Hamilton was adamant, was out, you know, beside himself, urging the use of military force against those farmers. And they did deploy a regiment of the army. I don't know how many people went. Uh, I think it was in the, in the many hundreds. But I'm, I you know, could be wrong. Look it up. Uh, they deployed the U.S. Army to round up those people, bring them to justice, quote-unquote, uh, put them on trial and convict them in order to collect new taxes from their own people. That was the first use of the U.S. Armed Forces, to collect taxes from their own damn people. Okay? Are you surprised? I'm not surprised at all. You, and you should not be surprised if you are. So that was point number five. Um, point number six. Stateless territories are notoriously difficult to conquer. They're actually far more difficult to conquer than the states. Unlike a state where all you need to do is take over the government, you know, the infrastructure, the taxing infrastructure pretty much, and uh, all, all of that is already in place. All you have to do is take it over in order to extract resources from a stateless area though. You need to conquer and occupy it door to door, person by person. As the British found out, not just the British, but I think the Vikings too, um, as they were trying to conquer Ireland. Um, it took the British 500 years to conquer stateless Ireland, which existed for 1,000 years. It's not that easy to do, to conquer a stateless area. 
Also, compare and contrast how easy it was to conquer the empires of the natives. And I'm borrowing from like another here. This is this is actually a brilliant insight that I wasn't aware of before. How easy it was to conquer the empires of the natives uh, in South and Central America versus stateless tribes in North America. Night and day in terms of the amount of time and resources and blood it took, even considering the overwhelming economic dominance of the Europeans, as well as dominance of sheer numbers in particular encounters, not in every single one. Um, it, by contrast, uh, a handful of uh, conquistadores conquered, what was it, the Inca Empire? Which was which outnumbered them by like hundreds to one or something. All they had to do was take over the, the heart of the government. And that was it. The empire folded. Um, now imagine a mo modern technological society that is not lagging ten thousand years in terms of technology and development behind potential opponents, and that is immense. And that is immensely wealthy as modern Western technological societies are, are compared to most of the rest of the human history and to most of the rest of the world today. Can you at least see that defending such a society is not automatically impossible? How specifically defense can be organized is the subject of a lot of research, which I'm not going to go into here. But to say that it's impossible is kind of irresponsible. I'm going to leave it at that. Point number seven. Also, defense is actually far less expensive than offense in terms of material, equipment, etc. Who says that you need a $4.6 billion aircraft carrier for defense? Actually, in today's dollars, it's much more than that. Or a 133 million F-35 fighter, which will cost over its lifetime six to seven hundred million dollars to run and maintain over over its lifespan, based on you know different estimates, and those tend to be conservative. I think the, the actual cost is likely to be much much higher than that. Another point: military procurement will always lead to inflation of cost because there, because there is no market check. The state monopoly military buying equipment will always overpay. It will always co cost much more than it could. So the stateless area has a huge cost advantage on these two counts easily. Point number eight. Also, stateless territories are, at least theoretically, less likely to become the object of aggression in the first place by state for reasons three and six above. And the reasons three and six above is, you know, states are more likely to start wars uh, and provoke armed response. Uh, that was the reason number three. The point number states Stateless territories are difficult to conquer. They're hard to conquer. Again, think about uh, Ireland. It took England almost 500 years to conquer tiny Ireland that was very close to them, and it took them you know, 200 years to conquer all of huge India that was very, very far away from them. And they expended far more resources in conquering Ireland, and spent you know way more time doing that than they did in order to conquer India, state as opposed to a stateless Ireland. Um, I mean, I, I have no hard evidence for, for the fact that stateless territories are, are less likely to become the object of aggression by a state. Um, I, I don't think that such hard evidence is impossible, but at least my intuition tells me that I am right. Um, point number nine, on a separate but related note, look up Rummel's book, Death by Government, and Google Democide, D-E-M-O-C-I-D-E, -E, -E, Democide. Um, and uh, Rummel is a researcher who has hmm, he's amassed data on how many people in the 20th century and before were killed not in wars, although wars are also started by state, but by their own government, right? If Rummel is anywhere near correct in his research, and I don't see any strong arguments to suggest that, to suggest that he's not, Governments in the 20th century have killed north, north of 170 million of their own people, of their own citizens, not counting wars, which were also started by government. I don't see how people living in statelessness in those same areas where all those atrocities have occurred, having no governments, how that, uh, having no governments that would command such massive resources and put together huge armies and police and other repression forces, how those people would have fared you know, any worse. And how, how that would have resulted in, in, in more bloodshed than it has under state. For an institution that's supposed to be indispensable to protecting life, liberty, and property, kind of has a very shitty track record. So, to conclude, I wouldn't just dismiss stateless defense out of hand as impossible or undeniably worse than the state. I think, you know, it, it's very far from obvious for anyone who has any actual knowledge of history. Um, also, to, to revere the state, an institution responsible for the greatest numbers of deaths compared to all of the earlier history combined in the 20th century alone. 
as this wonderful protector of life, liberty, and property, is just moronic. The state is highly problematic, and its nature, its very nature, presents very powerful incentives for the worst kinds of people to do the worst kinds of things under the pretense of legitimacy. So that was my summary um, that I posted on Facebook. Um, that's how I sum up my views on uh, libertarian defense. Again, uh, comparing it to the status defense, it is not even close to obvious that a status defense is better. If you want to live in an area and you want to be safe from war, aggression, and death, but you know, from a bomb from an airplane or from an invading uh, army, uh, to me, it's not at all obvious that living under state is safer than living in a stateless or an anarchistic area. So, um, what I think I've done in these two videos is demonstrate that A, I can't keep a cigar lit. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, that A, um, anarchistic legal order, anarchistic polycentric law society is not inherently unstable and is not impossible. It will not necessarily collapse and revert to a state, and it will not create horrible living conditions for you know, people living, living in that territory. Worse living conditions, necessarily worse living conditions than you know those that they have under a state. And two, that in terms of defending that territory from a potential statist aggressor, external aggressor, you're not obviously better off living under state in terms of your safety and security, being protected from invasion. Really, to me, that these arguments are kind of definitive. I mean, you know, at least any responsible thinker, or rather no responsible thinker, can just say, oh, no, it's impossible, and, and that's the end of it. No, no, you can't do that. There is historical evidence. There's lots of, like, uh, conceptual uh, arguments to be made for the viability of a stateless society. Um, and I have not seen any one person who, who I would consider um, reasonable who, ha who has dismissed these just out of hand um, and, and 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 you know didn't want to didn't want to move from their position at all. Um, so anyway, let me know what you think about these arguments. If you have any other insights to support these positions, please share. I'm I'm always willing to learn uh, more. You know, new ways of you know thinking about these things. I'm always interested in interesting perspectives um, that are not familiar to me. Another thing, oh. What was this point? Hmm. I feel stupid. I just I had just had this thought right here. It's gone. Oh well, it's gone. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, that concludes the series of two videos about the viability of the stateless society or anarchy. Let me know what you think.